Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today, as you requested, uh, we will talk a little bit about lesson planning. And um, we had to do actually lesson planning and, uh, during our next uh, in-service day. And today we're supposed to be teaching methodology with uh, Sarah, but because, you know, the good news of Sarah is graduating and uh, she didn't r- actually realize that that's the day when we're having the in-service day. So we're just doing it the other way around. And you're going to have to, you know, be okay with me <laughs> <laughs> in front of you. Waalaikum right. salam. Uh, do take a seat. Um, so it's just going to be plain old me. Uh, as I said already to the to the ones who were here, um, so there's probably going to be quite a lot that you already know. You have either studied or you know from your own experience now. But I think it's good that we go over it and then maybe you know you're g- going to have some little ideas, maybe we can do some idea sharing between ourselves as well, because we do have people who are good at what they're doing, so why not, you know, use their um, training. And so, first of all, I would like to uh, start with this little thought. Teaching is a privilege and a gift. Not all people have the skill to impart knowledge, much less to educate other minds. Not every person has the patience to teach. So for a person to go into teaching, he or she will need to have the love for sharing, the passion for enlightening, and the goal of making a difference. So I think this goes hand in hand with what we would like to see here in FLA, uh, especially, you know, it's not just about, oh, I know something, so I'm going to come and talk about it, but we would like to find the best way to kind of get this knowledge from us to the pupils that we are teaching and that can't be just something that we're forced to do we would have to actually love doing this job in order to do it in a good way another thought actually kind of the same but uh, said in a slightly different way if a doctor lawyer or dentist had 40 people in his office at one time all of whom had different needs and some of whom didn't want to be there and were causing trouble, and the doctor, lawyer, or dentist without assistance had to treat them all with professional excellence for nine months, then he might have some conception of the classroom teacher's job. So that's basically, if you put it, you know, um, this way, it, it makes you understand how hard the teaching job is, how complicated when we're talking about teachers or lawyers they can concentrate on one client at a time whereas us, okay, we don't have 40 pupils in class at once but still even if they're 15 or even if they're they're 10 I mean they are all different people and we need to convey the message differently sometimes and that's what is the challenge not that do we know our subject if teaching was so easy that all kids did all of their work, paid attention all the time and got it right the first time, anyone could do it. Real teaching takes patience, intuition, coaching and building relationships to help kids win unlim- with uh, unlimited variables succe- succeed. With unlimited variables succeed. Yes, um, so once again, the same thought, uh, just uh, worded in a slightly different way is mostly about conveying the message. How do we convey the message? And this is something I would, I think we cannot, you know, put emphasis on enough, even when we're doing our lesson planning. And me as a teacher, I've gone through that. And I've seen, like, especially if you're a beginner, it's like you're concentrating a lot on what you need to convey. So I need to teach the kids how to praise Allah, for example. So I'm going to, uh, you're, you're planning on what you are going to do. Okay, so I'm going to have to tell them this and I'm going to have to then show them. But you're, we're not doing a lot of planning on, you know, the other side. And I think that is very important as well, that we do think about that. So if I do that, if I was a child, would I understand? If I was a child who had to constantly move about, would I be able to get some information from the way that, you know, the teacher's uh, teaching the lesson. So this is definitely something we need to put into thought as well. Well, So from here, then, I think the main topic for today or the main goal 
uh, we can't just go and do something in front of the class. We need to have a plan for it. And the three most important questions we should ask ourselves when we are planning for our lesson is, what am I teaching, obviously, but also who am I teaching and how am I teaching? So these three questions, always keep them in your mind when you're planning for your lessons. Uh, three words here uh, that very often I think the, the, the terms get mixed up between themselves and I've seen it uh, here in FLA the teachers sometimes they are confused like what is the curriculum and what is the syllabus and, and what is the lesson plan and can you please give me the lesson plan uh, they wouldn't know which one is which uh, so in very general terms, the curriculum is a general outline of what students should be learning about for the whole school year. It's very general. It just gives an idea what the two students are doing. It can also be not just for one year. It can be a curriculum for, right, so primary school. They should be taken from point A to point B. And these are the subjects. So this is the curriculum. Syllabus, then, is a speci uh, specific topics and subtopics for the subjects. So, okay, so we, we want the children to learn how to read and write and calculate, and now we're going to talk about, you know, we want them to, for example, in Arabic language, we want them to be able to talk about their family, we want them to be able to talk about, you know, what they're wearing. Uh, these are the different topics, but we are still not exactly... Uh, you know, saying to the teacher how she should teach it or what ma materials she should be using. Syllabus is just, okay, so this is basically what should be taught and the subjects that, uh, that, that uh, should be uh, uh, covered. Uh, if we're talking about from FLA's perspective now, then curriculum, and I'm, I'm going to come back to it uh, in just a, just a bit, but curriculum is when we talk about it's as a whole, you know, FLA. When we talk about, for example, we want the kids in pre-FLA to accomplish this, and from stage one to stage seven, we would like to take them from here to here, and then, you know, FLA advanced is that. They, they're going to be doing that. So that's the curriculum. Syllabus is, even though there's, you know, in, in different uh, schools of, of thought in education, they do tend to mix the syllabus and the curriculum, the, the, the use of the word, up a little bit as well. So um, sometimes the syllabus might be called a curriculum as well. So that's why I think it's a little bit confusing. So, for example, me, I actually prefer saying that this is a curriculum as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I really want to, you know, make it really clear, then I would have to say it's a syllabus. So when I say go to the Dropbox and check mm -hmm. stage three, Arabic curriculum, so, so actually that's the syllabus mm -hmm. that I want you to check, but I call it the curriculum, so like, this is, so this is what you should do during that year in a specific uh, subject. And lesson plan, then, is a detailed daily or weekly account of how each topic will be taught to the students. So a lesson plan is what the teacher will write on the basis of, um, if we talk a little bit more specifically about the curriculum. So in public schools, set on the governmental level, in private schools, the curriculum uh, is uh, the national curriculum plus the extra, usually. So it's not even the schools who decide what the curriculum is, usually. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, certain bodies in the Ministry of Education who say, like, okay, so this is what we're going to do. So in Scotland, it's the Curriculum of Excellency, for example. So this is already set. Even in private schools, they have to teach usually by the same curriculum. They, just, they can just add things like extra, extra work for the children. Uh, in our school, because we are not actually a primary school, so we are a supplementary school, or even we can call ourselves an after-school activity club, um, it is set by the governing body of the organization. So it means like we can't just go ahead. Anybody is okay. We, we need to change our curriculum. Like that is something like the reason why FLA was, was created is because the people who created it has had a vis vision for FLA. So we can maybe here and there, you know, change certain things, but the main point remains that like we, we need to take the kids, you know, through 
certain subjects, we need to teach them certain skills, so we can't just go ahead and change this the way, the way we, we would like to do. Um, or if there is, you know, any change, changes that you think are very necessary, then it should go through, you know, the higher levels of the hierarchy. And as I said, so teachers have no power over changing the curriculum uh, w uh, while teaching their class, but of course you can make suggestions. And a very important is that every teacher, before they start uh, teaching, that they would, even though they, they are familiar with the syllabus, like for example, I've printed it out for you, or I've, I've referred to it, like go and check it on Dropbox, but you should tease on our website. But I think... I just thought when I was putting together the presentation, it would probably make it easier for you if you could, you know, have it with you, have a look, read through it. So it's also it's all very important to know about the other subjects, even if you're not teaching all the stages or all the subjects, but it would give you a good overview of where the children are coming from and where they should reach. So your little niche makes more sense uh, in that case as well. So this is the same uh, paper that I have just uh, given you. You don't have to read it now, but just uh, to, to, to have an idea. Uh, can I have a look at it at home? So the syllabus, also sometimes called curriculum, is the ex uh, extension of the curriculum. And it is usually set by the head or governing body of the school. So because it is more specific. Now already the school knows basically what they should be teaching, then the school governing body or the, the school head will then, then say, okay, so we will make it a little bit more specific and we will talk about, you know, the topics, the subjects. Um, and this is the first thing that uh, you need to check bef before you start teaching your class uh, or before you start working on your lesson plan. So you can't make a lesson plan if you don't know what you're teaching. So you need to check the syllabus. And also very important to compare it to the other stages and see where you stand in the, in the curriculum. Uh, as I said, you know, reading this, it would give you an idea. Uh, but also if you're, for example, teaching stage one Arabic, so if you, you, you're looking at the stage two Arabic syllabus, then you would get a better idea where your children should be able to, to reach by the them. So this is an example of a syllabus. So it gives the topics, but it doesn't say how you're supposed to teach it to the children. So syllabus sets the goals to reach. It does not dictate the teaching methods nor the teaching materials to use. So that usually is left up to the teachers. In a lot of schools, um, the, even the teaching materials are set. That can be a positive thing and that can be an annoying thing as well. Because, um, for example, if you're teaching math in primary school, and I don't, I've noticed that here in, in Scotland, the teachers tend to do a lot of copying, so they have uh, a lot of materials in the resource room and they're just copying from here and there. Uh, in Estonia, for example, usually what happens is that the, the, we have the, the ready curriculums, like we're talking about, for example, GCSE books. So we have certain books. We get to choose which book we would like to use. But the book is already there, so you don't need to go and copy here and there. So it can be very helpful if the book is good. Mm -hmm. But it can be very annoying if you're teaching something and the, the book is not good, and then the... the, the, the for example, the I don't know how to say that in English, like the the board of your subject. Because if you're teaching in a big school, there's a lot of math teachers, for example. So the head has decided that the math in each grade will be taught by certain books, and then you're taking the book and you're like, that's not something I want to use. So in that case, it can be very annoying, but usually it is helpful. Um, at least, so you would have a base. So that's what we're trying to do 
uh, for FLA as well, that's where we started with stage one, uh, with the Arabic workbooks and the Islamic studies workbooks. So the teachers would at least, it's, and it is something that has been created according to the syllabus already. So all the topics that are in there, it's up, you know that this is something that the kids need to learn in that year. So you don't need to worry about the worksheets. Then it gives you less work. Except if you're not really happy with the book. But in FLA, you can always then come and tell me, listen, I think this worksheet uh, is not good. Can we put another one in for next year? Uh, so that's something we can work on. But it would at least give you something that you already have. You don't need to lose a lot of time uh, inventing the wheel. Because there are things out there on the internet, and you can find them. But if somebody has found them for you or has created something, it's easier. Then you just need to create something around it because as you all well know we can't just make them sit and write and read they want to do certain activities and, and the younger they are they, the more they need you know these um, so um, now the lesson plans so in our case we're talking about the weekly plans which every, like every now and then I'm telling you okay has everybody finished their weekly plans <laughs> and I remember when I came first to FLA and I started working here. One of my biggest shocks, what, uh, sh shocks was that uh, I noticed that I asked people for the weekly plans and they're like, what is that? <laughs> what are you asking me for? And why should I do it? And why don't you give it to me? So that works for certain subjects, I would say. For example, our life skills, especially if the topic is very, very specific. And the, the teacher does not need to go and create a weekly plan. This is somebody else who has to do it. And that, in that case, the weekly plan is slightly different from the weekly plans that you will be creating as well. Uh, I mean, by, by yourselves. Uh, but in general, if you are chosen to teach a subject, that means that you are, you know, you, you have some knowledge about the subject. So you don't need anybody's help to make a lesson plan. And the lesson plan is not for me even though I'm asking for it, it's not like I want it and, you know, I'm going to go home and be very happy, you know, to read it. And uh, it is a helpful tool for the teacher. Why is it a helpful... Now, I wanted to show you some samples of lesson plans that we actually have in FLA. So there are many different forms, and I'm not going to tell to any one of you, do it this way. You do it the way you feel that is comfortable for you and also it varies uh, a little bit you know depending on the subject that you're teaching like for example for Arabic or Islamic studies and Quran learning you can't have the same kind of lesson plan because the Quran is like what kind of very different uh, study materials besides the Quran or the read book you're going to use at the end of the day so this, for example, is uh, Islamic Studies Stage 1 um, that I created a couple of years ago and that has been updated now uh, for two years, I think. So um, it's important that you have the subject, that you put it in the, the sub-subject, uh, the key terms so you would know what, for example, what words they're supposed to learn in, in your lesson. So the used methods, this space here usually is the one that I just told you about uh, that for example if you're going to do you know group work uh, we're going to listen to a story I'm going to read a story or we're going to watch a cartoon so the different methods that you're using to teach the children then this part would give you the overview of you know how many different styles you're catering for this is um, the, the, the reference to the study materials um, so, for example, this one is uh, Safar Year One textbook page uh, or Safar Year One workbook or international curriculum textbook one. And this is extra material, so I've put in, and the teachers have updated it later for if there's any YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, links or any other things. So this one, for example, is for uh, Quran don't need to go into that much detail but at least you've you know for example distributed you, you calculate how many ayats you have and then you've distributed them amongst the weeks and you've added all the extra things um, can work um, this one is for pre-FLA 
So you see, because they are doing Quran and Arabic and Islamic studies, so they've been put into the same than the materials for activities. So it would also give a good overview of what the teacher is doing each and every week. So this lesson plan, totally, a totally different one, but like also makes sense. Like every week has its own page. So if the teacher wants, they can, you know, print it out or just check, check okay, so this is the week I'm working on. So this is what I'm doing to, today. Today. So this is what, when I was talking about the life skills curriculum, because we do have a lot of quite specific subjects and the teachers don't have to have like a lot of knowledge about the subjects. So in that case, the lesson plan, um, it takes longer to, to write for each and every session because whoever is creating the lesson plan would need to make sure that the teacher knows exactly what they're doing. The teacher can do some, um, extra work by, you know, researching a little bit herself or himself, but basically, even you know, I've estimated how many minutes the activities would take, and then you know the teacher can change it if she, if need be. But it's usually not it's not just one line per week, but it is a couple of pages because it, it needs more detail. But we don't usually need to do that for any other subject except life skills. Why do you need a, a, a wiki plan? Why is it an important tool for you and not for me or anybody else? Is First of all, it will help you to know where you are standing with the syllabus. And you will not have any unpleasant surprises at the end of the year or maybe in April. You realize that, okay, so this is what I'm, I was supposed to do. This is the syllabus. These are all the topics and I'm actually still here. If you have a wiki plan, then what the first thing that you, that you do is that you check how many weeks do I need to teach those children? How many weeks I have? Usually it's around 40, slightly less. We have like 38, around something like this. So then the, all the subjects, you need to, you know, distribute them between the weeks. And then once you start teaching, you will see where, when you need to give some subjects, you know, extra time, but some subjects, the kids, they get them, you know, mashallah, very fast, so you don't need to stay on them for quite so long. Then, in that case, but it helps you, you know, to make sure that you will arrive where you need to arrive by the end of, uh, of, the, of the year. So that's first first thing, why it is important for you. Also, to have a better overview of, um, yeah, that's just what I already said where I am and where I should reach. So you always keep an eye on where you are and how, how much time you still have left to finish with the topics. Um, also, to have a better overview of the used materials and methods. What do, you, what do I mean by that is, you know, not all of you do that, but it would be very good and helpful for you if you note it down in your weekly plan which materials exactly you are using. So referring to, for example, this workbook, page this, and um, then we're, we're watching a YouTube cartoon, uh, we're doing a song, you know, because if you, if you note this down and you have it in this table then you also have a better overview of what kind of methods you've used and knowing that children actually learn differently, you would be able to make sure if you are catering to all styles of learning. Because it might, if you don't write anything down and you're going to just you know go with the flow, you might like lecturing a lot, let's say. That's a very traditional way of teaching, but not all kids respond to that. So you want to make sure that the kids who are not very auditive learners. We are, there are kids who will, you know, sponge up everything that you're saying, but there are others, they need visual aid. So for them, the lesson is lost, and you didn't help them to learn. That would make sure that uh, you keep an eye on yourself, that you are catering to all your students, to all your pupils. Um, and also... Me as a teacher, I prefer this, and that's why I've tr been trying to push it on, on, on you as well. Like, if you plan it all at once, you have a good overview of everything, and then later you can just, you know, add certain things, change certain things, and it would make your life so much easier. Um, you, you don't need to do the whole year, but at least, you know, half a year and half a year. If you have, like, a rough plan then it's so much easier to later not to be planning each and every week. Oh, my God, what am I going to teach them tomorrow, you know? Um, 
And also it makes it easier to delegate in case you need cover, like if you're sick. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of you good health. <laughs> or, or if you have to go away, then if you have the weekly plan, you can just say to your substitute, listen, it's this. Uh, who am I teaching was the second question. So we've got through now, you know, if you've figured out what you need to teach for the year, you, you've checked, uh, okay, so this is the school curriculum, this is my syllabus. And I'm going to you know, start working on my weekly plan now. So if you've distributed all the subjects into the, let's say, 36 weeks that you have. And now you're going to have to ask yourself, who am I teaching? So a good teacher will not just pull out a lesson from her book and use that for her, all her students. Ideally, teachers should customize the lesson so that it fits specific types of students which is very important. Like, you can't say also as a teacher, right, I did this lesson this way last year, and it, mashallah, it worked really well. So this year, I have weird kids, and they don't really want to learn, and my lesson doesn't, doesn't really, you know, it doesn't work. So it is up to us as teachers, then, to change the, the strategy. You know what Sarah was talking about, uh, reflective teaching? So whenever you see that this is not working, you need to change the strategy. You need to think of quickly something else because it will work, but you just need to figure out the way to get the message passed. So the questions that you should ask yourself again is, or, or what you should take into consideration is, I should know what subjects on what level I need to teach to my pupils. And I should know my pupils or know about them as much as possible. So, for example, if you start a new class, you don't know these children yet, you don't know them very well, at least you can get some information from their ex-teacher about, you know, how they are. And you would know how old they are. So that would also be, an, you can't teach, for example, a five-year-old and a ten-year-old in exactly the same way because they do not respond the same way. So you would need to take this into consideration. Even if you have no background information about their characters or the ways of learning, you, at least you know how old they are. And that should be a very big, uh, a very big indication for you. So, this the, in, he, here we come to this question, something that I've been thinking about as well since I started working here. And I, I see that, like, UK is a total parallel universe to what I've been <laughs> used to. And I've noticed that teachers change every year here. I do understand the point of it. Like, they say that it's because then every year a child will get a new chance, you know, and teachers are different and they have t different methods and you wouldn't want to get stuck with a teacher that, you know, doesn't really respond to you and you do not respond to that teacher. But at the same time, you know, the if you know your children and you can take them from one year to another, you can work with them, let's say, for three years, the same children, you would already instinctively know how they function at what works with them and what doesn't. So it would actually benefit you as well as the children. So there's two sides to this story, and I think there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but this is, this is definitely, if you need to change the, the children each and every year, then you would kind of, in the beginning of the year, be at, you know, level zero again uh, about knowing the children. That you uh, so what do we take into consideration? We briefly mentioned it already. So pupils' age, lessons should be prepared and created according to the age of your pupils. Children of different age have very different ways of learning. So, for example, I'm sure you all know about the visual, auditive, and uh, kinesthetic learning. Uh, so... Uh, the younger children are, the more kinesthetic learning they are. Does everybody know what that means? Like kinetic, it's a movement. They need to move or touch. So that's why little ones they do a lot of you know play doh and things like they can actually you know how Aisha in pre FLA like she uses certain things to make the letters and they have to actually create the letters, not just write but you know touch it. They 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 have to move around a lot, so that actually helps children learn and the younger they are the more they they they, they need this uh, kinesthetic learning uh, visual learn most people even when they are grown-ups they are better 
visual than auditive learners. So I'm sure that you've noticed even at uni level, when you're sitting in the lecture and the lecturer is talking and you're just you know sitting there and writing, um, so some people are drawing. They're not taking notes, but they are drawing. Yeah. Why they are drawing? Because they are visual learners. It helps them while they are listening. So you should never say to a person who is drawing while they are listening to you, stop that, put that pencil down, look at me. Because they're actually helping themselves to learn. That's their way of, you know, listening better to you. Or some children, when they are quite young, you know, they do this. They're, they're not looking at you. They're listening and they're doing this. They actually, they, they are still kinesthetic learners. They are helping themselves to listen to you, you know, to, to put themselves into the working mode. And then if you cut this for them, then... They, they will not be able to, they will look at you, but then it will, you know, it will go sh like this, because that's the way that they are learning. Of course, you should then find the right balance here, because if the child uh, is learning by, you know, jumping up and down and, and, you know, yelling out and he's disturbing other kids, then that's not going to work either. So the right balance needs to be there. But be mindful of this, that children, they learn in different ways, and sometimes they need this extra support for themselves uh, to be able to listen to you. And also, very important point, so children have different attention spans, according, especially like, you know, depending on their age. So uh, when you see that they're getting restless, try to, you know, change the activity or do something else so they can, you know, just the change of the, of the activity or, you know, a little bit of movement in between will put them right back to, you know, on the focusing mode. Uh, they say, actually, that... Uh, even for grown-ups, when you're sitting in a lecture, the maximum that you can concentrate without you doing something in between and then going back to concentration is 10 minutes. Like 10 minutes you can concentrate really well. So imagine the children, if you make them sit down for one hour and you say, you don't move, you look at me and you listen, then even if they're very well behaved and they do what you ask them, you need to ask yourself how much they are actually learning from it. So the, the best, the younger the children, then the, the more change is good for them. Like you do it in really small bits, little activities, and you change. And then you can always come back to your prior activity. But if you've done something in between, then it will help them to concentrate really well on this, you know, small, small bits. And it actually, if you're thinking about it as a grown-up, it helps you as well if you're not going to have to do the same thing for one hour. It depends on the, the activity, though. So yes. say the activity is cutting and sticking. Mm -hmm. Although that doesn't sound very um, time-consuming to us, I can cut and stick something in about 10 minutes. Stage one, cutting and sticking... It's three helpers, and they still take at least 45 minutes. Mm. So if one of the kids isn't responding, mm -hmm. I do tend to get them like away and help someone else with the cutting and sticking, and that gives them a sense of control over something. But it is very difficult to stop halfway through the cutting and sticking because maybe three or four of the kids out of 14 mm. isn't focusing. It like is the tidying up itself takes another hour or so. So, <laughs> yeah, the cutting and sticking in stage one definitely is quite a sure, tough yeah. one because a, a lot of them still don't know how to cut very well either. Yeah. So it's something that we're trying to teach them, you know, life skills at the same time. It's not just a lesson of Arabic or Islamic studies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you as a teacher try to balance that. And kids are very different as well. You might get one stage one that they, they're going to, you know, all do it much faster. And the ones who are lagging behind because they see that everybody else is doing so fast, they really want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then if they see that, you know, the, the, the leaders of the group are just, you know, relaxing and I'm not going to do that. It's going to, you know, put their um, speed down as well. Yeah. And you, you as a teacher, you take control of it. If you see the cutting and the, the, the gluing doesn't work, you know, say, okay, if you didn't finish cutting, the, the parts that you didn't finish cutting and gluing, you can just draw it or, you know, whatever. Give them something else to do as an alternative, but still on the same subject. And if you see it doesn't work on your kids, you're always welcome to do, you know, something else on the same subject. Uh, right. Yes, and, yeah, coming to this as well, so always consider whether your subject matter or materials or methods or expectations, etc., are at the appropriate level. So, for example, you might have a really nice 
So, pupils' level of learning. Uh, once again, here in UK, it seemed like mostly they, they put all same age children in the same classroom. Um, in a lot of other countries, they do tend to try to do that according to the level of the children. Um, back at home, for example, uh, when children go to school, they, they do an assessment in the kindergarten before that. So if the child is not considered to be ready to go to school, be it uh, uh, academically or even you know socially ready or physically ready, then the child can take an extra year in the kindergarten, and then there's no shame in that because children are very different. Or if some children are very advanced, they're already very bored in the kindergarten, they can go to school earlier. So this way, it actually makes the teacher's job easier because if she has the children in the class who are all the same level, she would need to, you know, kind of cater for just, you know, one group. Whereas if you have children who are the same age, but their level of learning is totally different, it makes your job harder because you still need to cater for each and every child and their level, taking into consideration. So that's why uh, in FLA we've tried to kind of make it a habit that we put kids according to the law. It's not, it's never going to be perfect. Especially that their kids also might be very good at Quran, but then suck at Arabic. You know, it's the same stage. But we need to find some kind of balance that would work. And I think, um, I think that 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 having all this, the kids with the same age in the same stage, for us, it doesn't work because first of all. I mean, the teachers who do it at school, then they have extra support or they, they, they do send more advanced kids to other classes, for example, or, or who are struggling, let's say, with reading. They are reading with the younger kids. But we, why, why not then just do it for you know, each and every day uh, in FLA? I think it makes more sense. But we do still need to take into consideration that even if we try... The special needs... Uh, can you tell me what you think the special needs are? Any special needs that you can think of, even when you're talk thinking about your own classroom? Mm -hmm. Hyperactive kids. Mm -hmm. Kids that can't write yet. Some people read them from the first lesson. Children that see them all differently. Mm -hmm. Dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of special <laughs> needs out there. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh -huh. No teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Faster learners. This is the point that I wanted to make. Special needs are not only the kids who are sli slightly or a lot behind because of something or who learn differently. Special needs are also the kids who have higher level ability. That is a challenge for the teacher as well as the child who's lagging yeah. behind for one reason or another who, or who, who responds very differently to other kids. So very often pupils exhibit learning uh, capabilities that are advanced for their age, so first of all, or they ha might have a very good memory. Whatever you tell them, they would know. So they are so advanced and that they actually get bored and the worst case scenario is if you have a kid who is hyperactive but a very quick learner because in that case, he's going to let you know the worst way possible that he is bored and he's not stimulated and you always need to find extra things for those children to do because otherwise they're not going to let others learn. So that's, that's why it is a special need. Because that child is not going to just sit there and say, right, I already know this, so therefore I'm just going to sit and smile. No, he's going to let you know that he knows. And he's going to dis disturb everybody else. So we need to cater for those kids. Um, there are kids, you know, when we talk about, you know, the different ways of learning, so the auditive, the visual, and the kinesthetic learning, there are, ki there are ch kids, like, or, or grown-ups, you know, there are some people who are only uh, visual learners. There are some who are auditive learners, but there are people who, you know, have it all. So wh whatever way you're trying to give them something, they're going to take it. So they will be, due to that, they will be more advanced than others. So um, 
as I said, you need to give that, them extra things to do. Uh, that's the, 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 the simplest way to deal with it. Um, and of course, it's not the same uh, thing for all subjects, as I said. Um, so that's where the struggle comes from. Somebody, but what we de tend to do now is from st stage three on, as you've noticed. And please do come to talk to me if in your classes you have this kind of struggle. Like, for example, certain children, they are very advanced in Quran. So then we can advance them, like we can put them up. Uh, we've just moved um, Asya from stage two. She's actually doing Quran with the stage fours. Well, Arabic and Islamic studies, she's still in stage two because she is advanced in Quran. So we should not, you know, we should cater for her. We should not keep her back, um, inshallah. Uh, and usually, yeah, in, 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 in normal schools, uh, then they, the, the, the head teacher would ask you, you know, if you have these kids who tend to get bored and they finish always ah, I finish I'm the first one have some extra work for them not maybe always related to that subject that you're doing but something that would generally benefit of course uh, we're not going to talk about like in, in detail about this today but there's also like special needs we're talking about physical disability so the children who can't you know uh, have the same movement as others or who have uh, hearing aids or you know who have problems uh, with their sight so we need to take this into consideration in these cases the best is you know to discuss with the parents because sometimes the children are very shy they wouldn't you know if you see that for example one child does not see very well uh, they can't copy from the whiteboard or whatever do talk to me about it or you know directly with the parents to see because then we can we can, you know, usually accommodate uh, for certain things, like to, have to make it easy. And of course, uh, so these were some of the things that you did mention, specific learning difficulties. Um, I think we, we, what would be a good thing if we could, you know, have a special session about this, because a, a lot of our work uh, as teachers is not just teaching the kids, but also, you know, noticing what kind of needs they have. And uh, we wouldn't know if we don't have any training about it. It is quite complex. So even just looking at this pe picture, so we have dyspraxia. I'm just going to quickly go over them and, like, say a couple of words for each and every one. So dyspraxia is uh, when people, they have difficulty of planning. And it's also called the clumsiness syndrome because these children, their movement is not exactly as usual people. So they can appear to be quite clumsy. These are the kids who, you know, drop things or when they're running, they fall down, you know, things like this. So for them, it's you're, you just us as teachers, the first thing we would like to say, well, oh, can you please pay attention? But it's not up to them. They just somehow their body doesn't regulate movement uh, as, as other people. So um, uh, dyscalculia uh, is the people who have trouble with numbers. So for like they, they would have, they have trouble with math. Um, we don't have that much connection with FLA in here. But for example, so uh, dyslexia uh, is people who have difficulty with words so they might struggle reading they might struggle uh, with writing uh, spelling even like when they're speaking they're not speaking grammatically correctly um, and they actually everybody's going this way they would go you know some they have their own system uh, in, the, in their minds um, it, it's sometimes there's also like there, it might there might be like very different versions of it. There are kids who can't read and write, you know, at all. They would you know write whatever and and would really struggle saying you know even the the short words. There are kids who read really well, but then when you make them spell something, it would be you know. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to read it. Very often they, they do phonetic spelling, like what, whatever they hear, they can, you know, for example, instead of, um, give me, choose, to choose, they would write t, sh, mm -hmm. u, t. And for them it's correct, because that's what they heard. Mm -hmm. But they don't make the connections between, you know, the different uh, sy systems that, that uh, uh, actually make up the spelling. Um, there is 
uh, ADHD or ADD, so uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder, hyperactivity disorder, thank you. Uh, why the H is between the brackets, and I think this is a very important for, thing for all of us to know, is that um, ADD, that's like a special case of, case of ADHD, usually when I say ADHD, what do you think the first thing? What do you think of a, a child who has ADHD is what kind of a child? child who is like really, you know, all over the place and, you know, always shouting and, you know, moving around and constantly, you know, trying to, you know, find their place. So hyper, but actually that's not the most common symptom of ADHD. The most common symptom is that the kids can't focus. So it's... The attention part, not the hyper. Exactly. So it's actually... Um, a lot of children don't get diagnosed and they don't get any help because you never notice as a teacher. And very often it's the girls because they're sitting in your class and they're smiling at you and they're looking right into your eyes as if they're listening. But then when you ask them a question, they would go, I don't know. But they were not there. They were looking at you because they are very polite and well behaved. But they did not listen because they can't focus. They were thinking of something else. You would ask them about Alif Ba and they start talking about butterflies. And you're like, what, she's mad? Is she, like, what is the matter with her? But it's just because she can't focus. And the older she gets, the more she would just say, I don't know, instead of telling you directly what she's thinking so the older she gets the, the harder it would be to understand what that actually this is the problem that she has so the hyper boys they will be fine because you you know you can see it right away or this and sometimes it gets mis misdiagnosed by the teachers as well the child is actually not does not have ADHD the child is just not very well mannered so this is I think a big thing that you know teachers need to have more knowledge about How which kids are Sorry. How can you diagnose? Well, as a teacher, you can't. Yeah. You need to go and see a specialist. But just so that we would know that not all kids who are hyper have ADHD. So when you notice it, what do you do? You tell the parents? Yes, because you can't go and refer to them to to anyone. But you tell to the parents. No matter what think you do, they're not going to pay attention. Because you're not trained, you're not specialized. They need one-on-one. No, one it's on one. The, uh, how you diagnose it first. Yeah, it's the so specialist. What kind of symptoms? They make could. they make different tests on them. So to make sure that you know they they are actually, you know, putting a lot of emphasis on this attention part of it, because ch there are children who are hyper, but they don't have a problem with focusing. Yeah. Like they would. Yeah. That well, we I have some pupils that, yes. who are you know yeah. during the lesson they go under the table and they yeah, kick I with their legs and whatever, but. To you would ask yeah. them any question and they know because they're all the time, they're listening, they would know. You make them, you know, you're reciting Qur'an and you think they're not listening because they're all over the place and you ask them to recite it back to you and they would recite. So these kids, they don't have problem with uh, paying focusing, attention, yeah, you with focusing. They have something else. Mm -hmm. But it's the children who are out of focus and hyper or just out of focus without any hyperactivity that have the ADHD or then ADD. So uh, Tourette syndrome, that's uh, verbal and physical tics. So that's when people are saying something without you know, controlling it or doing something all the time, but without them controlling it. Um, so autism spectrum disorder. So that's also a very, you know, very large thing. I think the bubble should be much bigger than any other bubble mm -hmm. here. Uh, because then that's also a very tricky one because um, there are certain things like dyslexia. You, you see a child that can't read. If you teach the child for two years and he, he or she still can't read, then, you know, obviously that child has dyslexia. But for children, certain children who are on the autism spectrum, you would never know because you are not a specialist. But there's, you know, certain little symptoms um, that you can't just pick up on. So you're just thinking that they're being rude or you're thinking they're being antisocial or, you know, whatever. But they're just, you know, 
in, in, in their yes. system, it's, it's okay, you know, that the kind of behavior they have. So it's very hard for the teacher to, to understand what it actually is. Well. And it's very sad for the kid because the kid is like, and they, they are genuine, like, I didn't do anything. That's right. But then you're, as a teacher, like, we're picking on them, yeah. telling them to be yeah. like others, but they can't. It's not their choice. They don't understand why you don't understand. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I think it's very important uh, that teachers do get more training on that. But I don't so know of any we, country... Can, we put, uh, can you put a, a list of things if you, for the teacher? If you notice the child is this, you should report. So you know a general outline mm. of what you should note and where to But it, the thing is that every it's child is yeah. very different. So even, even different. for the well, specialist... For example, I'm, uh, I'm teaching a class. I start to know the kids mm -hmm. certain uh, certain way. If I keep on going without noticing or uh, let others notice it, it will be a problem. But if I know that if I notice this and this and this, I should report, then it will be easier even on my mind. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a problem I need to overcome. Mm -hmm. It's something we can let others share it and take care of it. Yeah, it's like and if you can do something about it or you can't, it yes. would you know, be helpful for the so teacher. So they mm -hmm. have a general guideline for the teacher to know and to report on that thing. Then it will be easier. So I even you, when you come into a class, you, you will be uh, taken in consideration. The teacher get notes on, give your notes on that child. Mm -hmm. So you will be watching the child. Maybe you know better than the teacher. Then you can reflect and discuss with the teacher before telling the parents. Mm -hmm. because, because going straight from the teacher to the parents will make a, a big problem. Yeah, it might, yeah. Well, w what we can do for starters, like, if you a ha ever have any doubts about any of the children that you're teaching, yeah. you can always come and tell me, and we can try to see, but I mean, I'm not a specialist in the field either. Uh, but it's because but you are watching yeah. from outside yeah. the box, so you will be noticing better mm -hmm. things better than the teacher who's in the, in the thing. So, it will be better to to put a mark on that child, please watch it mm -hmm. and tell me if it's normal or not. Uh, at least you have two ideas mm -hmm. rather than just one. Idea. Yes, we could do that. So if I, if I mean you find any child yeah. that you think you know it's just misbehaving, not, not just misbehaving, yeah. you know it, it's something different. Then uh, I think just it's before I go straight to the parents and tell mm -hmm. them, well, your child having a problem, then you will be in a, another problem. So it's just having more I, more opinion mm -hmm. on that subject than you, you could uh, uh, record it or tell. Inshallah. Yeah. The other thing that I was thinking about as well is, I don't know how big a readers you all are, but I have quite a little collection about different learning difficulties, book, books, I mean, and uh, some of them are in English as well. I could bring them to FLA and... I will let you know on the group whenever I do that, and then you could, you know, borrow them from me if you want to read about. Uh, there are some books that are quite general. I do have a lot of books about dyslexia and how to help dyslexic kids. I don't know how many we actually have kids that, you know, are struggling uh, with that, but they say that to a certain extent, 20% of all kids have dyslexia. That's quite a big percentage. A lot of people kind of just work around it when they grow up. You don't grow out of it, but you kind of work around it, and it does get better. And, of course, there's a difference between like being heavily dyslexic and being slightly dyslexic. So maybe if we have a... Um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you reported any cases mm -hmm. which is having special need, we could have uh, uh, a reading notes on that condition mm -hmm. ready for the teacher to look. It would have to be a little bit more than notes though because as I said like like no, to every read a book on a certain thing maybe it will not be possible for, for everyone. Not for everyone but I mean but even if you read a little bit a, of it. Like a, a general guideline on something like uh, you know the notes sent by the NHS for example if you go to any clinic 
they will say, if you notice the child doing this or this, or the child doing, then y- y- you have to be aware, mm-hmm. and then get a, a specialist idea. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just a, a small thing on on the cases we have. It's better than... Inshallah, yeah. we could look into this, yes. But I, was still, I can still bring the books as well, whoever wants to you know, read about something. Mm. Also, uh, just a side note, there is no checklist for these kinds of things. You can't be like, uh, there's five things that you must have to be diagnosed as autistic. Yeah. You can't be like, oh, this person has tick, 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 therefore they are autistic. Yeah. It's not like that. Yeah, this is what I said. It's just you, a very you, general yes, idea. But yes. this is, the, wh- why, you know, the, the, the smaller the amount of information, the more confusing sometimes it gets as it well. Is. Because if it's a general, if it, it's, you know, I mean, p- even, for example, people who learn how to be doctors, how many times have I heard them? I have a very good friend who, who, who was in the uni uh, learning to be a doctor when I was in the uni doing my degree and every time single time she learned about a new disease she's like oh my god I have this and that and this and that symptom like even being a doctor you're kind of ticking the boxes and I'm like whoa you're having all the diseases in the world but it's like the same thing with this I mean each and every one of us has something from here it doesn't make us you know Having the, uh, the, the condi- and sometimes it's like you wouldn't even notice it's just so hidden one of my friend's daughters just got uh, diagnosed uh, with autism like you would look at her she, mashallah, she's brilliant she's a genius but like you would never you would never think if that she genius, was most of <laughs> I mean she's oh, a very genius. smart girl you would, but I mean like you would never think that she has any but learning disability my son also slept he has an autism, but it's never been diagnosed. And it was very, very hard life he lived. Mm. Even two doctors, <laughs> his mother and his father. But we, we didn't diagnose him. And in the school, we have a lot of problems since he is young, until he graduated from high school. We have problems, problems. But it never came to our mind that he is autistic. Until he diagnosed himself by himself. Mm-hmm. So yeah, then it clicked. And you ca- uh, kind of makes sense at the end. Like, oh, okay, so that's students, why. It's, yeah. it's gone. Mm. But if, if the like child gets... 20. Uh, if, he, if, if the child gets early diagnosed, it helps a lot and makes sure. In school system, they help a lot with uh, children with special needs. They pay a lot of attention, and it makes a lot of difference in the child's life. Even the exams, they, they don't sit exams with the same kids. They, they give them uh, extra time or a special way to, to do the exam. So it makes a lot of difference. So, uh, Can I just add something? So I think it's also important not to pathologize the condition as well. Yeah. So like for example, with my experience, I have autism as well. Mm-hmm. So basically, like, I, don't know, I used to go to mosque, and then my parents would like tell the mosque teacher, and they would use to pathologize it as something you would. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, 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 they dumb. look at they're you dumb. as yeah. And it's it's and what I don't know is that seems very condescending. Yeah. And they kind of underestimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of it's course. not a disability, it's yeah. a special need. It's, it's, yeah. it's very yeah. different. It's, it is, it is. But yeah, it's the just more the you people aware of it, the better it is. And this is why mm-hmm. I'm like saying it shouldn't be just, you know, little bits of information. Like you should know more or already for that reason. Like you can't say like any kids who have like special, you know, learning difficulties, like oh they are dumb or their IQ is low. No. It doesn't mean that at all. It's just yeah. that they, they function in a different way from the general public. But we should take it into consideration. There are ways they can learn and they can be, mashallah, you know, doing even sometimes better than other kids. Yeah. But we just need to know how to help them. But the, the other thing I wanted to mention, what makes it really complex as well, is as you see, there's a lot of uh, spaces that, you know, are in between the dip- yeah, and they totally actually nice. overlap. Mm-hmm. So you might think that, oh, knowing a little bit, oh, I yeah. think this child has this. But actually, the child has another condition, and the child is just, you know, on the edge there. Somewhere. A lot of people, 
think a lot of people. I think a lot of people think that all oh, these people don't know how to socialize. Mm. You do know how to socialize. Like, for example, I have a lot of friends. Yes, but people know certain things. It's, this is what I'm saying. Like a little bit of information. Uh, first thing that would come into your mind where people talk about when you're autistic, you don't have eye contact. Like I can look into Amina's <laughs> eyes, and it's not a, like yes, yes. autistic. No <laughs> eye contact, for example. So there's this kind of you know ideas that are out there, and people say, "Oh, I know, you know, autistic people are like this," or "I know, you know, dyslexic people are like that." But that's why. It's very important to have, you know, the larger picture, because otherwise you wouldn't notice anyway. Because in Amina's case, for example, like, can you, you know, if you're just knowing her, you know, like this, would you say, oh, she, uh, you know, by the way, like, she's autistic, like, it shows right away. It doesn't, you wouldn't know. a story, a very, very nice story. Very nice, maybe, maybe you read it. The, what is it? The, the night of the... Oh, the curious case of the dog in the night time. Have you, have you it's a very long title, but it we are not uh, qualified enough to diagnose mm. these kind of things. But you know your pupils. You know mm. if they have, you know, ha what they struggle with, what they're good with. So once you've been, you know, pr teaching them for, for quite some time, you already know. So you know what kind of methods you can use with them. So that's also very helpful. You don't e always need to, you know, stick a label on it. You would know what to do. But just to, you know, remind us that we need to do need to take it into consideration that. We if you see your pupils are struggling with something, find another way to... to uh, that's just another picture of the same thing. But basically, uh, you know, just wanted to show you how there's a lot of, you know, overlapping here. So a lot of things, you know, are, you know, they have the similar symptoms. So that's what, what it makes, what makes it so hard to diagnose. So impossible for us. We're not specialists in the field. Also, of course, we would need to take into consideration that, you know, the pupils are of different race, religion and culture. Well, in FLA, we do have uh, pupils from very many different cultural backgrounds. Uh, it's not very homogeneous. Homo Marwa, help me. Homogeneity. There's not, not much homogeneity. Yes, thank you. So, um, already we had the question uh, just this week about uh, halal versus non-halal, for example. Uh, gelatin, is it halal or is it not halal? So there are different uh, opinions of the scholars. We do not want to get into this dispute with the parents. So what we do in these cases is we, if the children, they ask us about things that we know are controversial issues and there are differences of opinion, we ask the children to go and ask their parents. That's the simplest thing because the children, they do follow whatever you know their parents mm -hmm. beliefs are and we don't want to have angry parents in FLA saying like why why did you uh? so if we know that this is this yeah. kind of issue we just let it be we are here trying to teach the children the tolerance between ourselves as Muslims as being but different if you as don't well discuss as discuss it they will always fight on it <laughs> yeah. Yesterday or the day before, they reached to agreement. They understood what schools are, school of thoughts. Mm -hmm. There is a school of thought. What's a school of thought? Uh, your sheikh is different from <laughs> They were talking about the, the sweets. You so know, we specifically. So a little bit. Alhamdulillah, at this age, they, they get it because it's really, they fight but they might, you might think, watch what Amal, you might also eat. think that they get it. Uh, Yusuf actually came home the other day and said, Mrs. Amal said it is okay to eat pork. <laughs> and I'm like, I do not I think, think so. I oh, do not there. think <laughs> Mrs. Amal <laughs> said anything like that. So, uh, and I Let tried to... <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't get me like uh, all you know confused now about this issue. Anyway, kids they tend to you know have their own way, their own oh, interpretation yes. of things. Yes, so sure. that's why it's always that's easier true. if we can just you know leave it because I know that they would I would I know what they were talking about, so I could explain it to him because yeah. I my office is right here, <laughs> so I hear whenever they have issues. But the thing was like I was like oh my god, the poor child who had come with Haribo is they're gonna slaughter him or something? Yeah. Like, oh, Oh, yeah, so um, in the stage lives, it's very, very difficult to just be like, ask your parents, 
Mm-hmm. When they're like, but we're asking you. I'm like, I did my research and I did this and I follow the example of my parents, so you should do the same until you grow up enough to do it. But that's not okay with them anymore. They want to know everything. Mm-hmm. And when you hold that away from them, they will be like, no, I don't want to be taught by you anymore because... You're not teaching me anything new. I know that you're, like, each person has different rules and there's different schools of thought. I know that. But I want to know why. And Mm -hmm. I want to know how or why am I doing this and why are they doing that. It's very difficult to do with with the stage fives to draw that line because the line is moving up and down depending on the way you phrase it, what you're talking about, their age, their cultural background, their Islamic background. And sometimes it is better to tell them this, this, this and this, all un- about the same thing. But remember that just because you have that rule, it, it's very difficult to just kind of throw your hands up and be like, ask mama, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I do understand that. I think we're on the same safe side now, though, with the, the issue. I did send out a message to all the parents yesterday informing them that, you know, these kind of things may come up. And we, the, our, you know, this is our policy. This is what we do. You know, we try, we, we promote tolerance and we need to just, you know, explain certain things to kids. So if your kids come home with, you know, certain things like that, don't think that we're trying to, you know, kind of, <laughs> but just, you know, discuss it with them and you're welcome to come and discuss it with us whenever you have, you know, worries. But it is, it is, you know, thinking like if you're looking at it, like you know, what, what kind of race, racial or religious or cultural issues might we have? We're like all Muslims and stuff. But so the qu- third question. So we were talking about what am I teaching? Who am I teaching? And now how am I teaching? So um, now that you know what you'll be teaching and who you'll be teaching, the next step is to determine the most effective methods for the knowledge to get to our pupils. So it's not about, I know what I have to teach, I go in front of the class, I tell them, and they will take it from me and just know. It almost never works like that. I know, I'm going to go and... And then the kids will know, because I... on them. Um, so in your lesson plan, you have to indicate as a helping tool for yourself the exact way that you plan to teach your lesson or at least think it through for yourself. Not just, I know today I'm teaching prepositions. That's not helpful because you didn't think how you're going to do it. What prepositions exactly you see fit for them you know, to, to learn first? You have to have in, in, in your mind. Experienced teachers have formulated their own metho- methodologies in addition to those they've been taught in uni. To choose a teaching method for a specific lesson and specific pupils often uh, ah, to choose. Yeah, often trial and error is needed. And the key is flexibility on the teacher's part because kids are not flexible in that sense. I mean, they will take it as they can take it, but the teacher has to figure out how they can take it and then deliver it in this way. So um, don't worry. If you get it wrong, sometimes happens to everybody, even teachers who have been teaching for 40 years and they have a lot of experience. You need to figure out for those kids, as I said before as well, like it might be that a year before the thing worked perfectly for a class and now, I mean, the ones who have been teaching the same stage for a couple of years, ML, for example, had stage three last year and now has stage three this year, I'm sure that you can agree with me that it's not the same type of kid so you can't be using all your last year's lesson plans and doing exactly the same thing with these kids as you did with the, with the other kids last year even though they are kind of on the same level and uh, learning the same things so um, it's normal that it doesn't all so um, about a little bit about the teaching methods so inshallah Sara will uh, go into depth a little bit more with this subject but just to scratch the surface a bit Traditional versus modern ways of teaching. I think that's the biggest question here. So lectures are effective for university students, but not that much for school pupils whose attention span is maximum like 10 minutes per task. So do you take this into consideration? And as I've said, even for grown-ups, you know, you can't be doing the exact same thing more than 10 minutes and not thinking about anything else. How many times we've all, you know, just thought of, home and cooking and whatever when we're sitting in class in uni. 
uh, keep your pupils interested, engaged, and motivated. Do not limit yourself to just one method, even though you might say to yourself, I'm very good at this. I'm very good at doing games. Don't do only games. But um, that you're passionate as well is key, because if you're not passionate, then... Exactly. So the kids, they kind of mirror you. So if you're just sitting there and reading from a book, you can't expect them to be pretty and learning today. You know, you have you are the one that they're all looking at. So whatever you are doing, they will be mimic, mimicking you uh, in a way. So you need to be the, the the good example there in front. So do not limit yourself to just one method. Yes, be, use as much technology as you possibly can for nowadays pupils because. If not for any other reason, it keeps them engaged and interested. So they are not that much interested in books as kids used to be at the old times. They, but they do look at you right away. If you're, you see, you're in class and you say, right, we're going to watch a cartoon or we're going to do a song, you see right away there's a total difference, you know, of their, you know, the, the way they are. They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to do a song. So if they're already motivated like that, that means that they are going to learn better. To make the most of pupils attention span, divide the lesson into manageable chunks and ensure that you have adequate activities that resonate well with the various types of learners in the class. So when you're doing your plan and you're thinking what you might do with the kids, you might have five very good activities, but if the activities are all auditory or all visual, then you should think of something else because you have to always think, right, so auditive kids, visual kids, kinesthetic, you know, and they have to, the, the, you know, putting the move, moving activities in between the others. So they would, you know, have this mix of things. It helps them concentrate better if you can just, you know, this and this and this rather than it all is the same. It, it might be, uh, you know, really good activity, but if it's too long or the same type of activities, then they're not going to concentrate. Make sure the activities relate to what you want to teach the pupils and are not too time-consuming. So this is, for example, the what Marwa was talking about, you know, the cutting and the coloring. And if you, if you see, this is not actually, I mean, this is life skills that they need to learn, but this is not the main reason why they are here. If you see that the cutting and the coloring takes too long, and plus they're bored and they don't really even enjoy it, then just do something else. You That's... I mean, if they're not learning, you're having an Islamic studies lesson and they're actually just learning. Um, so these are common teaching methods, lecture, presentation, discussion, reading, writing, translating, role play, debate, group work, storytelling, class visit, game or competition, watching a video, learning something by heart, um, Anything else that you can think of from the top of your heads? That's the most common ones. Yeah? And now I want to show you this. So how much are you letting them take part? So you see there's auditory, visual, and kinesthetic types of learning. So when you're giving the kids a lecture, this is actually... They said that after after two weeks, how much of what you have given them, they will actually remember. If it's a lecture, they will remember 5%. This sounds horrible. Even if they're nodding in two weeks, it's 95% will be gone. If they're reading something, they're more active themselves rather than just listening. They're actually working. And plus, they have the visual support. They're reading the text from the book. So that's 10%. So audiovisual together, 20%. Demonstration, so it's a little bit more of activity that they can see. So that's 30%. Discussion, where they are, they are actually taking part as well. You're asking them questions. How do you think that works? So that's 50%. Practice doing it, 75%. And teach others, 90%. So I think this one is something we really should, you know, reflect on how to make the kids not only understand what you're saying at the moment when you are saying or when you are teaching it, but also how to make them retain it. And from this pyramid, the, the, the best idea would be, you know, as much as you can, make them explain the things 
to others, make them teach others as well the things that you see a, cer- a certain child, for example, let's put you know some of the knowledge that we, we, some of the things we talked about today. Let's put it together. You see a child who is uh, very bright and who's learning very quickly. Why don't you? and he's bored because he has nothing to do. Why don't you make that child teach another child? He would learn some more, and the child will learn because there's a new way of teaching. There's another child involved. And children, very often, the teachers, I've seen it in my practice, you know, teaching languages and trying to explain certain grammatical structures or whatever, you know, in the, 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 the most simple way I can think of. And I'm actually quite proud of myself that I've thought about, you know, <laughs> explaining it this way, like, wow, I'm a good teacher. And then I'm asking the kids to do some group work and I'm going around in class and there's certain kids explaining to others and I'm like I never thought about explaining it this way and then the other child says, oh yeah I got it now and I'm like you're a better teacher than me but they're on the same level they're speaking the same language I'm still you know a grown up I'm on a different level I have like more knowledge than they do so I don't know how to convey it always on their level so this is the really the best uh, the best thing to to, to to let them teach to others what they know and also practice so when we're talking in FLA about you know we want the kids to do activities so once again it doesn't have to be always oh activity I will give the, I will tell them a story I will give them a picture to color in that's their activity part it doesn't have to be that because think do they do, do we really want them to learn how to color or do we want them to learn something about Islam so when we talk about Salah, instead of giving them a picture, for example, uh, to draw a person doing Salah, it would be more useful if they could do something practical. Or, for example, they're learning how to do wudu. Why don't, you know, for, why don't we, for example, take something that imitates the water and everybody has to do wudu and others will say if they're doing it correctly or not. Don't even need to leave, uh, leave the classroom. You can just, you know, take something that imitates the, um, the tap and then, okay, bismillah, and you do the wudu, let's see. And others will put points or something like that. They're actually doing it so they would, it's the kinesthetic part of it that will help them. So think of this kind of idea. So when we're talking about activity. Uh, one thing I did learn about, because um, I, I know that um, pyramid, um, their happiness negates everything about 30%. Mm-hmm. So if they're not happy doing it, it will either negate, so it will take away 30% of how um, good that activity is, or if they're happy, it will give them 30% positivity in them retaining that thing. So if you're forcing them to, say, do a presentation about a story of a prophet, for example, and they are shy, but they don't, they're like, they can talk and they speak, but they don't like standing in front of a group and speaking, the 90% will plummet to 60. But if you give them something like helping them um, practice doing it, so you give them a sheet in which they fill out all of the answers, that 70% will skyrocket to 95%. So the feel, the, the emotion that they have behind the thing will affect how much retention. Yeah, because takes. you're happy then, you're kind of like more open. Yeah, no, the brain actually activates like almost 25% more than if you are in a negative headset. So sometimes it will be assigning each child a different version of this. So Which is a lot of work, but at the end of the day, you want them to remember. Yeah, so it could be almost like one child really, really likes teaching others. And they're really good at it. Whereas another person doesn't like the way that I'm teaching the thing, but they understand more. So get them in front of the class for about 10 minutes. Teach them what you need to teach them in the first 10 minutes. And then the next 10 minutes will be other people teaching other people. So, so why do have with the stage ones is, so for example, if one of them wants to go to the toilet, when they come back, I get somebody else that was, in, that was present in the class, and I'll, I'll be like, okay, explain to your so-and-so what we were just talking about when they went away. So that's, that's how I kind of... Uh, they they, they t- yeah. do tend to understand, yeah. because then they would convey it on, you know, their level, mm-hmm. 
which uh, would give you to pointers as well how you should be talking. You know, as a teacher, we learn so much from the kids. Yes. Yeah. The way they they handle the same kind of situations as us. It just shows that they were listening. Mm. It kind of just gives me a hint that they're actually listening. Because yeah. sometimes I'm not really confident if they're not listening, but if somebody goes to the toilet, it kind of gives me the opportunity to like test them. Check. Yeah. yeah. Inshallah. That's a good idea. Good point there. Um, the cone of the same cone of learning, so um, in slightly different way. I didn't print those out, but actually maybe I could. Yeah, I will. I will put the presentation as well as the audio um, to to drop if you would like. So, common teaching materials. Now, coming to the materials. Um, so, what are the first? Teaching materials that come into your mind when we say teaching materials? Yes. Books. Books, yeah, so that's why I put the picture here. So books and or the workbooks are always the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry? That's my favorite thing. The my board. Wet, my whiteboard and my whiteboard <laughs> <board pen. laughs> pen. Yeah, the board is well. there's, there's, there's actually, well, the, the point that I try to make here is that People usually, first thing that they think of are books and workbooks. But that's not the only thing that we can use. There is a variety. For, vis for visual aids, visual aids are probably most common and the easiest to prepare among the, among the teaching materials. And most people are vis visual learners, be it kids or grown-ups. So uh, we should always provide, never mind that, that's my Estonian, <laughs> my, my Estonian spell check, I, 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 I uh, read through it and I corrected so many mistakes, for, for some reason the English didn't work and now you're actually it. supposed to leave your work and come back after 45 minutes I think, and yeah. that's when you see your work at the truest form. But it, it, it's, it's very tricky because it changed my words, oh. it's, it's the Estonian, so that's, so that's, that's an Estonian word. It. That's an, yeah, that's an Estonian. I like that better than the provide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry anyway. about that. So always provide visual support for, uh, for our class, be it text or picture, even like for example, um, very often we're telling, let's say, we're telling a profit story, yeah? So the reason why I scanned in the Islamic studies book, textbooks is that even if you are holding the book and reading the same story or you're telling the story to the kids, but the book, the, the story is in the book as well. If you put the, the scanned in copy on the screen, it helps the children who are visual learners. They're listening to you, but they're, they're maybe not even reading, but they're concentrating on that image. And at the same time, it helps them to retain what you are saying. So it's not for them to read. You're, you might be telling to yourself, oh, why do I have to put it on the, on the screen? I'm going to tell them the story myself. But it's not for them to read. It's for them to have this visual support to help them, uh, to help them learn it better. So, uh, so that's why I said be text. It can't be just text even. Like for, for example, now I'm talking to you. Yeah. I can tell you this thing, but it helps you to concentrate when you can look at the text at the same time when I'm talking. A lot of you are looking at the screen very often and not looking at me, but that's because you're visual learners. It helps you to see it at the same time when I'm talking about it. So the same for the kids. So be text, pictures, demonstration, videos or else. Pictures can say a thousand words if you do not have other visual aids for your Islamic school, as I said. So audio support. So first of all, the teacher talking, of course, is the most standard thing. Um, the t children reciting or repeating after the teacher. Um, it's also uh, helps whatever you are saying, if they are repeating it, then that's helpful for their learning, not just the listening. And always, always make the pupils sing songs because that is so helpful for learning anything. I can, as a grown-up, I can say when I started learning Arabic, it was very hard for me to retain the correct order of Arabic letters until I went on YouTube and I learned a kid's Arabic alphabet song. And now I know my letters. The same with the Islamic months or anything that they need to, you know, why, why children manage to learn or even anybody manages to learn Quran by heart, even if they're non-Arabic speakers and they don't understand a word of it. It is because of the way it is recited. Mm -hmm. So to we can use this 
miracle of our brain that's you know melody plus words makes more sense to us than just words uh, to, to make kids learn things by heart if they need to learn do use this so multimedia so cartoon or film or even play the kids doing plays um, it needs to be related to your lesson and not just wasting valuable time you know you need to uh, view before what it is so it wouldn't be for example too long choose something that really um, sparks their attention like something you say oh, okay so this this is about the story of the prophet and you put it on but it's really boring so it's just a waste of time if you could check it before it would be condensed and like really you know uh, uh, something that will will uh, get their attention and of course you need to check that it would be non-offensive and absolutely crucial to your lesson. So it might be also that you're thinking this is okay, but always think also if it is age appropriate, for example, uh, for them to watch. So we need to check. Uh, classroom activities. So role, uh, role of play. I think it should be role play. It's crucial in every. It's crucial in every child's learning. So students from every age, including adult students, can learn from a well-chosen activity. Like grown-ups are appreciated as well. And it is imperative to select activities that help pupils learn whatever you need to teach them. So um, you need to really make sure that those activities are connected to the subject that you're trying to teach. The best activities are the ones that are very similar to what they do in real life so that they can see the activities relevant to the daily life. So uh, that's actually, uh, that goes for any kind of subject. Like if you try to kind of uh, show them how, what they can do with this knowledge in real life, then that's always very helpful rather than if, even, for example, for teaching math. How many times have we heard children say, like, oh, why do I need to do this because it's really boring and I'm never going to use it. So if you t teach them something, show them how it is useful for them, or tell them, even, you know, math, if you're doing really complex things and you're never going to use it in your life, it's developing your brain. So it's good for you because you need a brain, <laughs> believe it or not, in the future. And uh, once again, always calculate the time. Uh, teaser, warmer, or introductory activities. So this is something that, from my own experience, I think is very helpful. Teachers very often don't want to do those because they say, oh, they are wasting my time and my time is very valuable. But um, it is actually helping you to be more productive later if you're doing this kind of activity. So it's like small activities to introduce the topic or uh, catch your pupil's attention and interest, uh, introduce your lesson, make your pupil see the topics relevant to daily life, uh, and it's also a chance to for them sometimes to socialize and get on the vo work mode. So it's kind of, you know, slowing down from whatever mode they were at before the lesson, and then, you know, getting them ready to, to study. Uh, and very important as well it should not take if we're talking about the the, the warm-up uh, activities it shouldn't take more than five minutes of your class so don't make half of your lesson the warm-up activity but it is helpful i've uh, printed out three copies of this if anybody wants to check if there's any ideas that they they, they might use it is uh, a te an english teacher actually who compiled uh, 100 different little activities the warm-up activities so there might be something you can use for arabic language here or even you know any kind of um, any kind of uh, lesson that you're teaching just to and you may take them home if you'd like and if you want me to print more i can print more or one person would, you know, bring it back and then and the next one would oh, take Apparently it. this is very good. Yes. Touching your fingers to your thumbs before you start. This uh, stimulates, your dexterity. Uh, stimulates, stimulates your brain. So it yeah, would make so your and crossing your arms as well, mm -hmm. your brain. So when a child, like, like a very easy way to get a child's attention or to get them to um, even like focus on one thing is uh, crossing your arms. Because the, the, the action of this hand going to this side of the body and the other hand going to the other side of the body, we all know that your brain operates on the other side. So the, le the right side of your brain 
is for your left hand and the right left side of your brain is for your right hand. So when you cross them over, your brain has to almost reset and be like, wait, hold up, pause, and reshuffles everything and then starts again. So when a child is being like really like is overwhelmed, for example, just crossing your arms and sitting there, even the pressure on your on your rib cage helps reset your uh, breathing as well. So it's a lot of good things when a, a child does this. And so I do it a lot for the stage ones when someone's about to cry. I can see them getting like more and more like hyperventilating. I'm like, when I do this, they usually copy me and they go like, hmm. and they start again. Good idea. Yeah, you might try that. Yeah, really I do this with my stage fives. Mm -hmm. See some good ideas to share. <laughs> so uh, and also. <laughs> Also, so some co some ac assessment activities at the end of the lesson, so to see how well the pupils have understood and how much they have retained. So you can do it at the end of the lesson, the same kind of you know idea to, to just make them you know kind of reboot. And at the and application activities, many pupils do not see the connection between their classroom lesson and their daily life, as I've already mentioned. So provide activities that will help them to put the new knowledge into practice so that pupils will see that what they are learning is actually useful to them because that's a big motivator if they see that it's useful. Uh, it is res the responsibility of every teacher to, re to present their lessons in an effective manner. So... Um, always think about these kind of things because as I said before already you know kids they are kids at the end of the day you can say that oh but he was not listening and he didn't care or something like this but it is our duty to make sure that we try, try our best to find the way that they will listen and the, the, the way that motivates them to take part in anything and of course as the last idea the more you practice, the better you get. So um, I hope that you've got some ideas for your lesson planning in the future. Um, not even just for the written form that you have to put uh, upload on Dropbox, but I mean for yourself as well. Um, that when you when you think of a subject that you need to teach it does not stay only you know right where is the book that I need to use but think larger think of the kids that you're teaching think of their age think of exactly what kids you have in your class how how you have seen uh, previously that they do get interested try to use the same tricks that have worked before inshallah do, do you have any questions or do you, do you have anything that you would like to discuss amongst yourselves? Any ideas you want to share? I have one thing. We talked, when we were doing our training last year, we didn't stop talking about the benefits of talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So making a WhatsApp group for all the Islamic studies teachers and all of the Arabic teachers. Mm -hmm. And we never do the stuff we say, oh my God, that's so good, I would like that. And it never really happened. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. are you guys... Do you want me to make more questions? That's what I was going to no, say. Okay. Do you guys, are you guys okay with me? <laughs> and I mean, I'm just taking charge and making the groups. Or do you not want to be in any more groups? Mm -hmm. I know, it gets completely confusing. Because yeah. so they confuse the event scripture with the main group yeah. chat. Because like, we've got the mm. same pictures. And, and I have an S1 um, teacher's group chat, and I confuse that with the FLA teacher. It's very confusing. Maybe we should. Maybe different logos would be better. Yeah. yeah. I can Are change the logo here? for stage one, uh, Najmi. Maybe for the events, we can put another logo. Would make that helpful, but yeah, okay, I think. Do you see my picture on there? <laughs> <laughs> we should take a group photo. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, be like selfie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think Indeed. it's a good idea, definitely. Because another thing, and thank you for bringing that up, because it actually reminds me that I wanted to say when we were talking about the curriculum and the syllabus and uh, the weekly plans and saying who is in charge of what. When we're talking about the syllabus, then it's not only me who is in charge of that. Like. Or, for example, when we're talking about the, the syllabus of the Qur'an, then all the Qur'an teachers have a say. So we have updated it, like, and we have made, you know, the changes. But I can only do that when you give me feedback. And I think 
it would make sense if you were in a group or if you had, you know, because we, I mean, the meetings, we have tried with, you know, having this specific meetings, but meetings, you know, don't seem to work very well. We are very technological as well, so maybe a WhatsApp group would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then if you have any worries, uh, if you have any concerns about your topic, and you can discuss with the teachers who are teaching the same subject uh, on different levels. And I think it's very helpful for us to go yeah. forward and then... So the group is enough. So You're only yeah. part of one group, and... No, no, for for all teachers to be one and one one group rather than there is no, but if we, for example, study, Ahmed, but because for example, if the Quran teachers so want to go want to into Arabic, you just say we are discussing or message to Arabic teachers. Yeah. Yes, but then we would maybe miss a, somebody would need to put yeah, something else in between, and then we you have to go through all the Arabic discussion to check if there's nothing that you've missed uh, yeah. on another subject. And me, <laughs> I have no eyes to read. <laughs> it's okay, I read them to you anyway. So it's <laughs> but, um, it would not make more text, it would just make it more organized. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to read about Arabic, you can ignore the Arabic group, yes. but you can't ignore, ignore me posting on the, the general <laughs> stuff group. That's, what, that's the thing, it needs a separation, because if I'm, if I'm open my phone after a whole day of studying, I'm on my way to FLA, yeah. and there's 46 messages on the group about a, cl- a student that's not even te- being taught the same thing as me. I'm like, why am I listening to you complain? <laughs> but when I go on to the FLA teachers, I'm like, okay, this I have to read because it will affect me. Yeah. Kind of thing. Okay. But yes. Yeah. Right. Have any formats? Anything else? Anything else? Does anybody <laughs> want to ask something about, uh, well, most of you have finished your lesson plans, but about, you know, lesson planning. Any extra questions? Uh, I think we need to build more resources. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I always uh, have having the, a difficulty finding the right uh, the right uh, uh, material for the thing. So uh, rather than making one for them, it's it's, uh, it's tiring. So I skip go to the easier <laughs> it's it's uh, it's all it's all the time keeps me thinking about something where sometimes taking a lot of my my mind mm. uh, either leave it all or do it all uh, this is a um, kind of a question. yeah so the, the resources has been quite a struggle I would say like from the beginning uh, and it will not stop being a struggle str- struggle until we have covered, like, from stage one to stage seven or whatever, yeah. everything. But it will, I think, take a very long time because just to... And, and another thing is, and it's good that you brought that, up, brought that up because I can mention it again. Whenever I, for example, put my time and effort into making resources and then I find them scattered all over the place then I really say to myself, why do I bother? Because nobody else can, somebody has used it, nobody else can use it anymore because half of the thing is missing and I don't know where it is. And even this one, you know, the the sign of what it is exactly is missing. So even a person who would need something on the same subject would not be able to find it. So the little resources that we have, can we please be mindful about treating them with respect and putting them back? in the resource room so other teachers can use them as well okay uh, another thing you may find the time to try to find uh, uh, upward in Arabic upward upward key. scrabble 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 in Arabic yeah. but not letters uh-huh. words mm-hmm. I'm thinking you're going to have to make that yourself it's all awesome. <laughs> but Scrabble is with the le- with letters. It yeah, I want give you wor- uh, That's what she means. Uh, so she wants the word you, if you could the look, letters, you, you can have an entire word. So on the on the board, for example, you make a sentence rather than a word. Mm-hmm. So it's does like it even exist? No, it does not. No, that's why I'm saying she's <laughs> making it. <laughs> about look, man, well, you told me about this last yeah. year, and I tried. I looked online everywhere, and I went. I thought I maybe I will. Uh, I have an <laughs> uh, old game, so I I thought maybe I will uh, make words myself and stick them on the thing. 
but it takes uh, a long time. <laughs> you uh, can, well, maybe not that that's one. That's really a good thing, rather than uh, ask them to make uh, to make a sentence. You have an assistant. Yes. Why don't you uh, ask her to <coughs> help you? Well, not maybe me specifically you know, with that, but something else she can, what that she can do. Sometimes the assistant make uh, more disturb to the class than help it. <laughs> That's something you tell And me. sometimes <laughs> when you ask her to do something, uh, she said, yes, I know. And then you, 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 you'll be watching from away <laughs> and find nothing being done with the way you want it. So Maybe you I didn't give her uh, good enough instructions. She's a child as well, so she needs very clear instructions. It is, but it's only two it happened hours. once to me with an admin. <laughs> I asked, I can you imagine? With the gun. I, with typed, the gun. I typed in so and I printed hour and, hour and I laminated all of you know the Quran words that we have, like fifty percent of the Quran. It's the first really useful, patch, but it's really useful. I, I the first it. patch that I did, mm. yeah, and I then I asked. <laughs> so the. I asked the main office admin to cut them for me and it was like a pile like that and she cut around the words. That's what happens with the things I gave And I didn't assistant. think of I telling her that you just cut like done. this, you know, straight lines so they would be all the same size. Yeah. And after <laughs> I went back and I just received a, a pile like this, she didn't even put like separate, I put numbers on it, like pile one up to I think it's twelve or thirteen. She just put them in a pile like this, and they were all like round and different to the shapes. I gave and to the assistant to cut. I find them, mm. them all, all very sharp or being cut from. This, uh, this can only happen mm. once. Let's be honest, because once it has happened, the next time you tell her, you will tell her more specifically. I want straight lines. And I want all the corners cut off because otherwise kids, they're going to hurt themselves. <laughs> uh, I have a question about resources. Yeah. You're saying that like, using multimedia ones and like different people have different views on things. And it was with um, pre-FLE. One of the um, parents asked me not to play videos that have music in them because... She's told her son like um, that we yeah. So, but I don't specifically like li we're not we're not listening to the music. We're listening to like like you seen the clean up song that I used. Mm -hmm. so it was helping like tidy up and or like an Ali Fanda thing. Maybe it has music in the back, but I'm not like we're not listening to music. Like that, uh, the the very better to give big child at home. point there <laughs> to make the is that we be. have a school. We run it a certain way. Yeah. Parents cannot come to tell us that you don't use this resource or don't mm -hmm. use that resource mm -hmm. because otherwise every single parent can have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. We've had the first year I started to teach, one of the first parents meeting I had is one parent just basically came up to me and said, I want my child to do more Quran and less Arabic. And actually I don't want my child to do any Arabic. Mm -hmm. I want... Uh, all the Arabic lessons that, the, the, that, that they're supposed to have, my child would be doing Quran, and I'm like, excuse me, we have a curriculum. So Everybody, if you do not like our curriculum, you can take your, I mean, in a polite, polite way, of course, mm -hmm. you can take your child to another school, and the, the, the parents very often, they don't actually think what a struggle it is for us to to find resources yeah. to teach the children. So then to come to us and, you know, one by one saying, I don't want this and I don't want that. Imagine we would have to cater for each and everything. So it's the Is same. Is that a child in the state schools? Um, it's pre-FLE. So, so they're, they're not at school yeah. yet. So uh, yeah. they're the 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 yeah. probably yeah. going to then yeah. homeschool yeah. the All child. All they learn is rhymes. Mm -hmm. All yeah. the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything. So why she is And he might have also misunderstood because he's a child. We were watching yeah. a video, but he might have misunderstood that this song is just like singing. Yeah. It, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. but in, in, in other yeah. schools, yeah. It, all they learn is song. Yeah. And these kind of parents, they usually think, opt for um, homeschooling at the end of the day. We did have a parent change. like that yeah. the yeah. first so year. I put Yeah, Taiba on right. video. And um, because the video was really quiet, I would sing along to the thing. It was yeah. only the words, and it was only me, yeah. and it was pre-FLA on a Saturday morning. So it's not like I was affecting any other classes by singing. Okay. I had three or four parents come to me that day and was like, 
my child told me that you have a very good voice and why are you singing in class? And I was like, da da da. And they were like, no, we don't want you to do that. And I was like, if you get me better speakers, I will not have to sing. <laughs> until that point, until you give me sixty pound speakers, I'm a singer in my class. Yeah, Some that day I did put like the clean up song on when we were tidying mm-hmm. up, and the children were like, "Oh, why are we not listening to it today?" And I just felt like you know, it was yeah. such a cute little song, and they were actually doing a very. It's like a little song to to tell to the kids that it's tidy up time, like tidy up, tidy yeah. up, tidy, tidy up. And then actually, you know, like, oh, yes. And uh, like until the, they have time until the song will finish. And they were so motivated. I was like, when I was sitting in your class, I was like, wow, this is a good idea. I found this little song. Uh, as long as the music has a, has a purpose, I don't see it. Yeah, I no, I do understand that there are, there are Muslims who don't do zero music. music yeah. And it's their right uh, but at the, at, at the same time, they can't come and tell to others then, like, okay, this, you know. Uh, we had a parent like that the first year I started, and the child already was homeschooled because the parents decided that they can't put the child to a normal school because there are so many things that they, they were, like, no, there should be no images of any living being anywhere, you know, in the books. So, so they were complaining about the, even the worksheets when there was, like, coloring something that had you know, all the proper eyes and nose and, and, and mouth. And, like, I try to explain to them, but, like, we can't, I, we would love, you know, to accommodate, to accommodate for everything. <laughs> but they, it, we just, <laughs> it's such a big time consumer for teachers to find good, you know, materials. So there's only so much that we can do. And we are living in this society. So... Um, at the end of the day, so the, the, the parents actually took the child out of the ballet uh, and uh, they said that we would homeschool them for Islamic education as well. But I don't see how that would be very it's beneficial a for a child. Yeah. A lot of work, but I mean, the child will have to come out of the cocoon at some point. And they would be very overwhelmed. It's going to be very, very debilitating for everyone involved. <laughs>